Hey, how's everybody doing? Good to be with you. Thank you all for the opportunity to join. And uh, I want to say thank you to Rosalinda, to Rose, for welcoming us, to each of you, for taking some time to come out and to welcome a friend from another part of the border, from El Paso, Texas, where uh, we've got some folks who know where El Paso is. Hey, thank you. Thank you for coming out. Um, it, it means a lot to me to be here. And when we first launched this campaign for government of the state of Texas, one of the very first communities that we chose to visit was this one. Yeah. As you all know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, as you all know, this is not a part of the state that often gets statewide candidates or elected officials coming out, certainly not to celebrate what is amazing about this community. It's a little bit harder to get to than the rest of the state. And as I counted the DPS troopers as I drove down from Laredo, Texas today, it also makes you drive the speed limit as, as you come in, because it gets very expensive otherwise. Um, but it's a place that I love, and we didn't just come here once when we launched this campaign in November. We have come back time and time again. This is actually our fourth visit to the Rio Grande Valley since we launched this campaign. And it's great to be back. We love being with you all. And I love everything about this community. First and foremost, the people who are here. Um, there is no one more kind or stronger or more proud of their community than those who are here with us today, those that I've met in my travels and journeys throughout the Rio Grande Valley over the last five years. There is a fierce pride and a desire to tell the story of this community, not just to others who live here right now, not even just to other people in the state of Texas, but to those throughout the rest of the country and the wider world beyond. You want people to see the natural beauty of this community this river that joins and does not separate these two people and these two countries on either side of the border. You are proud of the fact that this is a community of immigrants because you understand that those who choose to come to this country do better for themselves, yes, that's for sure, but they also do better for all of us in the things that they create, that they make happen, in the success that they produce, not just for themselves, but for the community, the state, and the country beyond. This is one of the safest cities in the United States of America, as is Laredo, as is El Paso, not in spite, but because we are cities of immigrants. We recognize that that is our strength and the key to our success. And yes, also our security and our safety. We understand that the border is primarily not a threat, but it is an opportunity. And we know that from what we create in this community, from the art and the culture and the music and the world-class education that we get right here in this institution. We know it in the trucks that cross in from Mexico that bring the food and the consumer goods and the auto parts and the things that our national economy depends on. More than six million jobs across the United States of America depend on what crosses in through our ports of entry, say at the far Reynosa Bridge, or in Laredo, or El Paso, or other ports of entry here in the state of Texas. More than 600,000 jobs throughout the rest of the state depend on what we are doing right here in this community. And though we never get our fair share of the resources, or the money, or the attention, or the focus, we still carry more than our fair share of the load and contribute far more than we ever get back from the state or receive from other parts of the country. And we're rightfully and understandably proud of that. But here's what we cannot stand, and what we will not accept, and we will not take, and which I will not allow to happen when we win this election and I become your governor after November <laughs> We will not allow people to demonize us or vilify us That's right. or lie about us That's right. or say that we are something that we are not. We Tell know it. full well exactly who we are. 
when they see us only as a problem and as a security threat, wow. you start to get things like walls and the activation of 10,000 members of oh, the National no. Guard who are deployed not to fight a war far, far away or to respond to a hurricane or a natural disaster in this state, but to sit in those Humvees along the side of the highway. No, no, um, no. Part of a solution in search of a problem. You get things like part of a border wall that is more like a public art installation project than it is anything else. You know, the part of the wall that Greg Abbott put in, I think, was as wide as this room. You can go on this side of the wall, you can go on that side of the wall. But, hey, if he wants to look tough when he comes down to the Rio Grande Valley, or to South Texas, or to the Texas-Mexico border, well, I guess that's what he has to do. You get things like 100% DPS inspections on all northbound truck traffic through our international ports of entry. Now, I don't know that I need to tell anyone about what that does to our economy here, but just give me the privilege of repeating this for those who may not be on the same page. All that trade that comes through our ports of entry that supports all these millions of jobs throughout the country, it's only possible when we have the flow of safe and legal truck traffic in through our ports with Greg Abbott stopping literally every single truck for an unnecessary safety inspection. Under the guise of public safety and security, though those DPS troopers cannot look into the cargo holds for illegal drugs or human beings who are being trafficked, he's able to maybe score some political points for those who are persuaded by those kinds of theatrics, but he is killing this border economy he is destroying jobs throughout the state of Texas at a time that we already have way too much inflation. Having those trucks sitting and idling on the bridge, crossing once every three days instead of three times in one day, that's a supply chain problem right here of his making. That's more inflation that the governor of Texas is causing. And when you would go into the grocery store and see higher prices for everything that you want to buy, from bacon to produce to anything else that allows you to feed yourself and your kids, you have one person, but one person to blame, and that is Greg Abbott. That's what happens no. when you see the border as a problem. That's what happens when you see us as a threat. That's what happens when you describe us as something that is going to come and get the rest of the state. And beyond the jobs that it costs, the inflation that it produces, the supply chain problems that it exacerbates, it can also turn deadly. And I gotta tell you this, and it is tough to talk about, but it's important that we all understand. When you have a governor like the one that we have today, who talks about invasions of immigrants who are coming here to get us, when he says, as he did in 2019, we must defend ourselves, people of Texas, and then says this, we must also take matters into our own hands. You better believe that people are listening to him. There was a guy in Allen, Texas, North Texas, who heard the governor and heard the former president using those same words about invasion and infestations and the rapists and the criminals who are coming to get us from Mexico. And he took an AK-47 and he drove it 600 miles to El Paso, Texas. And he walked into a Walmart in my hometown on the 3rd of August in 2019. And he started to shoot and kill and slaughter the people of El Paso, Texas. Anyone who looked to him like an immigrant, maybe because their skin was brown, or the accent with which they spoke, or the fact that they may have been speaking Spanish instead of English, didn't matter to him, he killed them. Grandparents, parents, kids, completely innocent people, all for the reason that he was told that they posed a threat to him and to the state. In the message that he posted on social media before he went in and started killing people in El Paso, he said, I came to repel the invasion of Hispanics who are going to take over the state of Texas. Using the same language the governor, the former president, others in positions of power had used to talk about border communities like this one and mine in my hometown. 23 people dead. And I met some of them before they died, kept alive by doctors and nurses and modern machinery, all manners of pumps and hoses and wires and cables going into their body to try to feed them and keep them alive when their internal organs were shredded. 
by the high impact, high velocity rounds that came out of that AK-47. I spent time with their kids and their spouses and still stay in touch with them right now. And though it's many years later from that day on the 3rd of August, 2019, those wounds are still with us in our community. There are many people who feel because they are Mexican American, they now have a target on their back. I met a young mariachi who said that she was no longer going to perform because she said, I am a symbol of the Mexican culture that those in power are teaching the rest of the people in this state to hate right now. I say all of this to remind you of the cost and consequence of someone who does not understand us on the border, someone who hates us on the border, someone who tries to sow fear and anxiety and hatred among other people across this state and throughout this nation. Not only must we stop that, but we must turn the page and start investing in the border. Instead of $3 billion on activation of the guard or building this wall or surging DPS troopers to the border, what if we invested in connecting the Rio Grande Valley with the interstate highway system that connects to the rest yes, of the country? Yes, yes, yes. What if we made sure, yeah. what if we made sure that school teachers who are underpaid by more than $5,000 a year in this state get an honest salary for the honest day's work that they do here. Go teachers! Go teachers! What is Teacher. In a state that is the least insured in the nation, here we sit and stand in the least insured part of that state. Where the largest provider of mental health care services is the county jail system, where there are people among us who are dying of diabetes. Although insulin has been around for more than 100 years and is incredibly cheap to produce, but for the lack of insurance, they will succumb to that at an early age because we have not formed the political will to do something about it. What if, instead of scaring people or spending money on solutions in search of problems, we invested in healthcare, expanded Medicaid in the state of Texas, yeah. made sure yeah. anybody who needs to see it or see a mental health care provider yeah. is able to do that right here in the Rio Grande Valley. There is so much promise, so much hope, and so much potential here. You all know that. You are it right now. I see it every time I'm here. As governor, I want to make sure that we unleash that. I'm going to speak with pride about the people of the border. Those who I live with in El Paso, those kids that Amy and I are raising in my hometown, and yes, the people here, and not just those of us who come out tonight, and I'm grateful that you did, but those I've had the chance to visit with in their communities, in their colonias, who say, hey Beto, lived here in this house on this street for 20 years, it's never been paved, never had a street light. Every time it rains, it floods right here. I pay my taxes, I live by the rules, I follow the law just like anybody else. Why am I treated like a second class citizen in my own state and in my own country? Well, when I'm governor, I'm gonna make sure that the resources of the ninth largest economy on planet Earth, the state of Texas, flow evenly and equitably to every part of the state, including, importantly, the Rio Grande Valley. You have my commitment on that going forward. And this is what I want you to remember. We're going to make sure that we focus on the things that can actually bring us together and that can improve life for everyone in the state of Texas. Not the culture war stuff, not the things that divide us, not those issues that pit one Texan against another, but things that Republicans and Democrats and independents alike can agree on. And I'll try three out on you right now. One. Let's make sure that we are creating better and higher paying jobs for anyone who wants to work yes, in this sir. community or any part yeah. of the state. For those who want to enter the medical profession, say you want to be a nurse, right now we ask you to take on tens of thousands of dollars in debt for the privilege of saving our lives and taking care of us when we're sick. How about this? When I'm governor, we're going to wipe clear the debt of those who want to serve yeah. their communities. Thousands more nurses, especially in underserved communities just like this one. Yeah. We're also going to make sure that if you are a psychiatrist or a psychologist, 
in a mental health care desert like the one that we're in right here. We want to attract or retain you right here in this community. We will also make sure that we wipe clean your debt in exchange for your commitment to serve yes. this community. We're going to yes. do that right here in the New York Times. We're going to make sure that we have more energy jobs. And yes, it's important that we protect the oil and gas jobs we have right now, but we must expand them to include more wind and solar, hydrogen and geothermal. We could be the world's energy leader on renewable energy that frees us from any dependence on foreign oil in any other part of the planet that allows our grid to actually function every single day of the year, even when the temperature drops in the Rio Grande Valley and that allows us to confront the challenge of climate before it is too late. Those are high paying, high wage, high skilled jobs, and if we do it right, they'll also be union jobs. Yes, yes, yes! Woo! That's the first point, great job. Point number two, I wanna make sure that we have a world-class system of public schools. And yes, it means that we need modern school buildings and the latest in technology. We want to make sure that we have that in every part of the state. But the most important thing, everything else in fact pales in comparison, is that educator. And I mean the classroom teacher, I mean the counselor, I mean the school librarian, I mean the support staff, the cafeteria worker, the school bus driver, everyone who makes public education possible. We're going to make sure that we treat them as the professionals that they really are. We're not gonna ask them to work a second job to support their habit of teaching our kids in the classroom. We're gonna pay them enough so they only have one yeah! job. I'm talking the of learning in those kids. Yeah! If I were governor right now, we would cancel the STAR test. No more high yeah! school. Our retired teachers, those women and men who put a lifetime in the classroom, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, some of them have not had a cost of living adjustment since the year of our birth, That's right. And four, when I'm governor, there is going to be a cost of living adjustment yeah. every single year in the two states with inflation going forward. We do that, we will be able to yeah. attract and retain the best of the best in our public schools, and we will begin to achieve better than our peer states going forward. Public ed is something that all of us, regardless of party affiliation or part of the state, can agree on. Point number three, and last one. What if we did what every single one of our border states have done so far? Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, most under Republican governors, have expanded Medicaid to make sure that more federal health care dollars flow into our communities. It's $10 billion a year for Texas that we are leaving on the table right now. Not only are we the least insured state, not only are people dying unnecessary deaths and living far sicker than they would otherwise have to be, not only are we not recruiting the physicians and medical providers that we desperately need in our communities, but it's also hitting us where it hurts the most for homeowners and renters, and that's in our property taxes because when that person with diabetes, who now has glaucoma, but doesn't have insurance and cannot afford insulin, finally gets so sick, and the suffering becomes too much, and they take themselves to the hospital, that bill might be 50,000 bucks, it might be 150,000 bucks, it might be a lot more, but because they have no capacity to pay for it, it doesn't mean that the bill disappears, it just means that you pick it up in a higher property tax bill or higher rates if you're lucky enough to have insurance. When we expand Medicaid, when I'm governor, we're also gonna lower your property tax bill. Yeah! Yeah! So listen, those three ideas, those three ideas that bring us together, great jobs, world-class schools, the ability to see a doctor, fill a prescription, see a mental health care provider when you need to, that's not so controversial. That doesn't pit us against one another. That's not gonna further divide an already very fractured and polarized state. And it is the perfect contrast to the guy who holds the highest position of power right now, who wants us to fight over every issue under the sun right now. Like this craziness about pursuing transgender kids 
and turning in their parents no, for child no, abuse no. and taking those children from the loving adults who've raised them and are trying to help them navigate one of the toughest things that a child can go through. We want to keep that kid in that house and make sure they receive that love when they most need it and when they're at their most vulnerable. Yeah! We also want to make sure that we don't distract the people of Texas on things that don't matter, like which kid goes into which bathroom and all that stuff, and focus on the things that do. There are 30,000 kids who are in the foster care system in the state of Texas. And a judge six years ago said, those kids emerged from foster care more damaged than when they went in because we have so underfunded child protective services. We don't support those caseworkers nearly enough. We haven't hired enough of them. And we've started to privatize the care. We say, hey, look, the state of Texas can't figure this out. You, private provider, you do that. And there won't be the oversight or scrutiny that's necessary. Well, here's the result. Six years after Greg Abbott was first told about this problem in CPS, the same judge who said those kids go in and, and leave more damage than when they went in, she said it's gone from bad to worse. She has found that those kids are sleeping in the CPS offices, under the tables, out in the hallways. She's determined that more than 100 kids in the custody and care of the state of Texas lost their lives just last year in the foster care system. Hundreds more have been trafficked for their bodies, literally rented out while they were in the custody of the state of Texas, all on the watch of the one man who has the power to do something about it. But did he do it? No, he instead decided to focus on transgender children and their parents. It's the Shame. same guy Shame. who's decided that he's going to attack every single woman in the state of Texas. Yeah. He may tell you this is about pro-life, maybe at best it is pro-birth, but what it really is is an attack on every woman's right to make her own decisions about her That's own That's right! Her That's own right! Her own and her own future. And, and además, he put a $10,000 bounty on the back of anyone who assists any woman in making her own lawful, constitutionally protected, reproductive health care decision. The end result, not only are abortions banned in the state of Texas, not only did we have someone in Starr County indicted for murder, for a miscarriage in this state right now. This is not fiction, this is not The Handmaid's Tale, this is reality in Greg Abbott's Texas. But we now lead the country in the rate of maternal mortality, three times as deadly for black women in this state as it is for white women. We lead the nation in the rate of teen pregnancy and repeat teen pregnancy, because not only can you not get an abortion, try getting a cervical cancer screening when the reproductive health care clinics have closed down, try getting any family planning help whatsoever in the Rio Grande Valley or any other part of Texas. When I'm governor, you can be sure that Texas will guarantee that every woman makes her own health care. Yes. Yes. yes! yes! Makes her own choices. Yes. In Great Abbott's Texas, he refuses to trust the voters with the outcome of the elections. He's literally deciding, choosing who will be allowed to vote going forward. Seven million of our fellow Texans did not vote in 2020. Not because they're not lazy, not because they're lazy or that they don't love our democracy. It's because we have the most restrictive voting laws in the United States.